So thanks a lot for uh, inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's great to be the last to talk, so I can also comment and uh, uh, make connection with what uh, Emanuele and Maria were saying before. Uh, so this is a, a joint work with many people that are not here, like Francesco Lamperti, Mar Napoletano, Sandro Sapio, Giovanni Dosi. And this research has been founded by the Growing Pro Project, which is a project from the uh, European Commission, and this Economics for Energy uh, Innovation and System Transition, which is uh, a project financed by the British Minister of Energy and Industry to try to use complex methods for the green uh, transition. So I think I don't have to convince, oh, this is not working, okay. Okay, I don't have to convince anybody here that climate change is very relevant, that we are in a climate emergency, so uh, everybody, I guess, have read the last uh, IPCC report, and uh, the Antonio Gutierrez, the United Nations Secretary General, was uh, pointed out that this report is a code red for humanity. So we, are very, we have uh, uh, very few years to change uh, things. Uh, what is very well known is that, of course, uh, we are observing uh, an increasing of emission and also an increasing of uh, uh, temperature, so there is the famous uh, uh, hockey stick. But what is less uh, understood is that uh, due to climate change, also the economic damages of natural disaster are sharply increasing. So we had this uh, paper uh, in the proceeding of National Academy of Science where basically we employ quantile regression and we show that if you consider the economic cost of extreme events, this has been increasing since uh, the World War II, and they are increasing uh, fast. So this is already is not considered the last few years, so you can imagine what is going to, uh, what is going to happen. Well, what are the, the main problems? Well, there are problems on the policy side, because if you consider the, the current policy, uh, the projection of temperature is going to be between 2.7 to 3, uh, and even if you consider the pledges and the target is going to be 2.4, which is not so good because the PCC is suggesting below 2, possibly 1.5. But I think that there are also serious problems with uh, model, with economic model, and in particular, computable general equilibrium uh, integrated assessment model. Why did I put this picture? Because this is taken from Nordau's Nobel lecture, and you can see that uh, at least the first generation of the DICE model was suggested optimal policy doing a cost and benefits analysis that would have bring the temperature to two degree. So there is a sort of disagreement between the first version of the DICE and Nordhaus and the IPCC, and I prefer to stick to the vision of the IPCC. Uh, why is that so? Well, because uh, there are very serious problems for standard neoclassical models. Some of them have been pointed out very well by uh, Emanuele. And so the, it's very difficult to be, so to speak, syncretistic, to make connection between the two, because this model has serious problem to take into account some feature which, on the other, on the other hand, uh, complex-based and agent-based model can do. So I'm thinking about dignity and uncertainty, learning and innovation, structural change, pa possible path dependency and login, lock-in, heterogeneity, and agent interaction. And if you want just in a, in a sentence, typically a uh, standard integrated assessment model underestimate the cost of extreme event and also underestimate the benefits of technological change and uh, so on. So uh, what I'm going to, to, to do here, well, I'm going to talk about this agent-based model and the result that we got from this model, so the dystopian Schumpeter meeting Keynes model, the DSK. Uh, which we think is one of the first integrated assessment model where you have endogenous innovation, endogenous technical change, so all the uh, Schumpeterian part. You have a climate box with possible feedback loops between the economics and the climate environment. Uh, you can also study the couple climate and macroeconomic dynamics in a way that, for instance, also uh, Maria has shown before, and you can use it also as a laboratory to test a different ensemble of uh, policy. And you can consider both the short and uh, the long run. Just let me tell you a sneak preview of uh, the result, in case I'm not able to, uh, to finish in, uh, in time. So uh, basically what we find is that this model is able to reproduce a rich set of micro and macro regularity, 
typically what we find is that there are emergent tipping points, and after the tipping point, the cost of climate change are catastrophic. And uh, you can, as you are in a region-based model, you can pinpoint, you can single out different effects of different climate shocks on different economic variables. Typically what we find is that the financial system magnify the cost of climate change, and on the policy analysis, you need large-scale and timely policy intervention. And typically what we find is that carbon tax is not working so well because you have a trade-off between the economic dynamics and uh, the basically uh, uh, achieving the target of climate change. On the contrary, if you have a mix of command and control and innovation policy, this is uh, the best policy mix, so to speak, to trigger the green transition and... Uh, uh, so to speak, support the economy. So you can have a sort of win-win pathway, which is in line with the Green New Deal. So let me just go briefly to this uh, model. Uh, well, this model is, we try to have the, the simplest agent base you can have to, to discuss about this thing. So you have capital good firms, which basically produce capital goods, and this is where you have the Schumpeterian part of the model, because you have endogenous technological change in these capital goods. You have the consumption good firms that invest in these capital goods. So here you have, on the one hand, technological diffusion, and on the other hand, you can have possible Keynesian effect due to investment instability and possible heterogeneity of uh, uh, expectation. So in a way, in principle, you can take uh, the, the point of Emanuele, who having heterogeneity of expectation, something like that. We have a paper on this with other co-authors. Uh, you have a financial system which is providing credit to the consumption good firm. So here you have a sort of Minsky and links between the activity of the bank and what the, bank and what the firms are doing. And then you have an energy sector which is providing energy to capital good firm and to the consumption good firm. This for possibly the economic flow. Well, what about the climate related flow? Well, here uh, on the one hand you have that capital good firms consumption good firms and the energy sector are releasing greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And on the other hand, you have this climate box, which according to the level of the temperature that is possibly increasing over time, you can have climate shocks that goes and hit different variable at the firm uh, level. So let me just be quite brief on that. We have this uh, capital good firm, that, that this machine, which are characterized by different coefficients like labor productivity, energy efficiency, and so to speak, environmental uh, uh, friendliness. This, you have the typical evolutionary structure where you have R&D investment and possible innovation and imitation at the, uh, at the firm level. And you have that these consumption good firms invest for Keynesian reason, that is to expand their capital stock, but also for uh, Schumpeterian reason, so to speak, to uh, replace their capital stock to increase their uh, competitiveness. The, in the energy sector, for the moment, we have only two types of um, plants. So you have basically dirty plants and green plants. The extreme assumption that we have is that the unit cost of production for the green plants is basically zero because this is sort of renewable, while for the dirty plants you have to pay uh, the price of having this fossil fuel, uh, given also the thermal efficiency of the plant. So here you can have all the possible problems with the gas price, for instance, that Europe is experiencing now. Well, on the other hand, if, you, if we assume we, we play against ourselves, so we make this assumption where this dirty stock of plant is basically that you don't need to build a new brown plant, what you have is sufficient. On the contrary, every time you need to add capacity of green plants, you have to pay a fixed cost. So this creates a sort of trade-off. And also here you have technological change because you can have in, uh, innovation, both reducing the fixed cost of green plants, or you can have also innovation by, for instance, increasing the thermal efficiency of dirty plants or reducing their uh, emissions. So in principle, you could have a C CSS, CCS. Uh, the banking sector basically is providing credit to uh, the firm, so in this model credit is uh, endogenous, and here what we have is that uh, this model is able to deliver endogenous or emergent banking crisis. Why is that so? Well, because consumption good firms can fail. If they fail, they don't pay back their credit to the banks, and uh, if these uh, um, bad loans become sufficiently big, this can trigger a problem for the banks and the banking crisis because also the bank go 
uh, bankrupt. And this also creates a problem for the government that needs to step in to save uh, the bank. So you have this possible relationship between the financial side and the real side of the system. Okay, the climate module. Uh, we tried different uh, uh, versions of it. Uh, one of the ones that we use quite a lot is that we link the emission to the temperature through a core carbon cycle characterized by possible nonlinear uh, feed, uh, feedback loop. So we also take into account the possible capability of the herd system to uptake uh, emission, and this is changed uh, over time. Uh, what about the climate damages? According to the level of the temperature, you can have these climate shocks, and these climate shocks goes and hit different variable at the firm level. So some firms can be hit in their labor productivity, other firms can be hit in their capital stock or in their inventories, and some firms can be hit by, so to speak, uh, uh, everything. These damages are drawn from a typically a beta distribution. Why is that so? Because well, we, this distribution is pretty flexible, and we uh, allow this distribution to change over time, so it's parameter to change over time according to the evolution of the uh, temperature. We also try a different type of damages, for instance, in line with uh, Nordhaus and, uh, uh, and so on. So let me just give an idea of, of the empirical validation of this model. This is typical time series that you can have uh, simulating in one run uh, uh, the model. Uh, of course, you can also have a simulation of the temperature, so you can have a temperature proje uh, projection, and as you can see here, for instance, we, the climate shocks are not there, and you can see that the temperature distribution, so moving, doing a Monte Carlo analysis, you can see the temperature distribution basically shift to the right. And not only the temperature is increasing, but also, you can also consider the possible variability. So this also, in this agent-based framework, allow to exploit, so to speak, this idea of uncertainty in many dimensions, and this is one of the uh, dimensions. Well, here are the typical variables that are reproduced with Monte Carlo exercise. I don't spend time here. And uh, here, uh, just to convince you, if you have some doubts, just a table of all the stylized facts that this model is able to reproduce both at the macroeconomic level and at the macroeconomic level, possibly quoting uh, the paper, uh, which provide empirical evidence according to which we uh, validated uh, our model. So let me just move to uh, the possible macroeconomic effects of the climate change. Well, typically what we did was now we switch on the climate shocks. And uh, uh, you can, what you typically you can see is that if you have climate shocks, you are in a, so to speak, hot house scenario, as Maria was saying, basically because typically with productivity shocks, uh, the growth performance of the system uh, collapse. And also you have much higher level of unemployment rate. What is also interesting is that different shocks have different effects. Because, for instance, if you consider the energy efficiency shocks, this has a limited impact on the long-run performance of the system, uh, but it can have a strong impact on the chance of getting the green transition, and we'll try to show this in a minute. Uh, what typically this model shows is that you have emergent tipping points. So uh, we split the simulation, so 100 year in 25 year, and you can see that for the different type of shocks, typically in the first and in the second run, the situation is more or less uh, okay. So everybody thinks the situation is not uh, so bad, no? as typically some policymakers are saying and also some economists. But at some point, once you pass a threshold, the climate shocks, the climate impacts become so big and so strong that this is going to affect the uh, economic system. So this model shows no linear effect of climate change, which are typically much higher than uh, a standard computable general equilibrium model. Well, another way of looking at this is to plot the GDP growth rate distribution uh, in two cases. In the first case, so the green one is that when you don't have climate shocks, so you can, temperature can increase, but you don't have climate shocks, and you can see that as time goes by, the distribution basically does not move. Uh, on the contrary, the red one is when you have climate shocks, and uh, in this case, typically what you have is that the GDP growth rate shifts to, uh, to the left as time goes by in the last part of the distribution, and also the variability increases. So typically we catch this uh, stylized fact according to, to which 
climate change is increasing not only the long run performance, but also the variability, both at short run and the long run uh, frequency. So in this case, you can have uh, emergency of hysteresis in the system and even super uh, hysteresis. Uh, the finance sector in this model can magnify the cost of uh, climate change. So we, we, we run a series of experiments that we publish in Nature Climate Change, uh, and typically what we find is that if you have the banking sector, the cost of climate change increase. Why? Because the firms are not able to pay back for their debt because they have been hit by climate shocks. This trigger banking crisis and this is increase the cost for the uh, public balance to save this bank. So you can see that the public bailout cost increase over time. We were running also different simulation, switching on and switching off the uh, finance sector, and this was a way for us to assess uh, how much the financial sector was increasing the cost of uh, climate change, and typically our counterfactual experiments show that 20% uh, of the economic growth that you lost is, in, uh, is uh, uh, due to the interaction between climate change and the finance uh, sector. Okay, another topic that we tried to explore was this idea of green transition. How easy is to get this green transition or not? Well, this model typically uh, is characterized by path dependency and logins and locking. So, if you don't have policy, in most of the cases, the model end up with a carbon uh, intensive lock-in. And what is very relevant are the first 25 years. So it's very important what happened in the very uh, beginning. Uh, in very few cases, without policy, you can have a transition to the green sector. And you can see that uh, typically the performance of the system, uh, or in this case, you, don't, you cannot see because there are no climate shocks, but this is just, just to give an idea of this um, past dependency lock-in. Well, when there are the climate shocks, well, what you typically observe is that when there are the climate shocks, the performance of the system is much worse in the case you don't have this transition. And now energy efficiency uh, is uh, a serious problem because it does not allow to have this green uh, transition. So it reduces the likelihood of having this uh, uh, transition. Uh, other the last things I would like to cover are possible the policy for this uh, sustainable uh, growth. Well, so far we have shown that this uh, cost of climate damages can be very, very big in this hot world, and we can use the model as a, a, a laboratory to study different combination of policy. This is an ongoing work, so we don't have paper on that, but I mean, we have already this uh, result. So the idea was, what, what is the best policy mix to try to get the two degree target at 2100 on the one end, and what are the possible economic implications? So is it true that try to get this target is going to affect negatively our uh, economic system as some people are uh, advocating, at least uh, in Italy? And also we also want to have more information about having a smooth transition and the cost that you have during this uh, phase. So the, the type of taxes that we try was well, different type of uh, uh, carbon taxes. Uh, for instance, we were compatible or not with uh, the DICE uh, model. Uh, we try different type of subsidy here where uh, this subsidy goes to uh, build green energy plants or subsidy for green R&D at the firm level. We use regulation or basically what we call command and control policy. And the idea is that you have mandatory electrification with a 20 years grace period and uh, a ban on construction of brown plants with 20 years uh, grace period, something that is uh, discussed now. And we consider different type of policy uh, combination. Uh, what, what are the results? Well, the first result is that carbon taxes are not very successful or are not the best policy tool uh, to trigger this transition. Why? Because you face a sort of uh, uh, trade-off. So on the one hand, uh, you need a very high level of carbon taxes to have this transition. Otherwise, you are not able to move or to achieve this two, uh, degree, two, two Celsius degree target. But on the other hand, if you go for 
these very high carbon taxes, what you typically observe is that there are very high transition costs in terms, for instance, of uh, unemployment. So there is this sort of trade-off between these very high taxes and the transition and very high unemployment and so on. Well, using gradual uh, carbon taxes, as for instance was suggested by Nordhaus and so on, is not working uh, at all. So it's not the solution of this possible uh, trade-off. On the other hand, what we tried was to uh, combine this common and control policy and this uh, subsidy, this green subsidy, and to check what, uh, what is going to happen. Well, here we find that the results are much uh, better because, in particular, we find that if you, have, if you combine uh, common and control policy and uh, green subsidy, you can have this uh, rapid uh, transition in both the energy sector and uh, in the manufacturing. Uh, this transition is not costly in terms of economic performance. Why? Because this trigger uh, typically investment in the energy and the manufacturing sector, so basically aggregate demand kick in. So you have this basically Keynesian effect which uh, allow to stimulate the economy in the short run. Uh, there is also a very small uh, cost for the public budget, so it's, the cost is from 1 to 2 percent of GDP per, uh, per year, and in this case you can cover this cost simply by introducing a small carbon tax. So carbon tax in this model typically uh, is useful only to pay a bit for the, 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 the small cost of the green uh, transition, not for triggering the transition. So here, well, basically the, uh, the result. So typically the red line is just command and control policy, the command and control plus the, uh, some type of uh, subsidy, and the green is with all the possible green subsidy you can have, and you can see that uh, the unemployment in this case is much better. So you see shaded area, well, typically because as this is a Monte Carlo study, you want to take into account of the possible uncertainty of the uh, simulation and so on. Okay, so let me skip this and go to the last topic that I would like to cover. Well, we have seen that financial market can greatly amplify the cost of the climate impacts. Well, can we uh, study, can we develop some uh, uh, green financial policy that can help, uh, that can, uh, uh, help to sustain this transition? So we consider three types. Well, the first one is uh, a carbon risk adjustment. So now bank in the model take into account of the carbon footprint when they decide whether to provide credit or not to the firm. Uh, another one is the green credit easing. So basically the government, in this case, backs loan to the uh, firms which invest in green capital goods. And you have a sort of green macroprudential regulation. So you assign a zero weight to the loans that are provided to the green uh, uh, firms. Uh, we run different uh, uh, experiments, and these are the results that uh, were published this year in the Journal of Financial Stability. So uh, an interesting result that we get is that each policy alone is self-defeating, so is not able to achieve uh, all the possible objectives, but if you combine all the policies together, you are uh, allowed to achieve uh, a win-win dynamics. So typically, these three type of policy, this, which are basically not expensive policy, can help and in particular can support the other mitigation policy that we were discussing uh, before, typically the command and control and the green subsidy uh, policy. Let me just to uh, conclude, try to summing up what we, uh, what we got. So basically we find that the, the cost of climate change is catastrophic, is going to be amplified by the financial sector, you need to intervene uh, as soon as possible, and you cannot do it with carbon taxes because there is the trade-off between transition and, uh, uh, and the possible cost in the short run. So, and the best policy tool that you can have is to combine this regulation plus green subsidy and uh, help this policy by managing the financial sector with green financial uh, policy. If you do this, basically you would be able to stay below two degree, uh, and you're not talking about optimal. In this case, optimal is surviving of uh, uh, of our planet, so to speak. Uh, but at the same time, you are not going to penalize the uh, economy. So let me just conclude with this uh, very nice work of 
Banksy that uh, is uh, in Camden in, uh, in UK, which I think is pretty appropriate when you hear some talk about uh, climate change. And here are the list of the paper I was talking about. Thanks.